right. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get started. So thank you all for being out here tonight and on this beautiful evening um, and giving up a little bit of time uh, to spend with us tonight to just talk a little bit about our situation and current realities as it relates to Gaines Elementary School. Um, my name is Ben Leinka. I know many of you in this room. Um, I'm the superintendent here in Swartz Creek, and so I have the pleasure and opportunity to, to work in this district and serve uh, the kids and families. And I want to start off by just kind of talking about what this is and how it came about. And so first of all, um, we, as you know, this past year have had a very, very tumultuous and crazy year that we've just come through. We're very thankful uh, to have had a very successful year. Um, consider, considering all that we had in front of us. But one of the things that has come up over the last year, and it's really been kind of a growing concern, has been, you know, what is the state of enrollment in our buildings, in particular at Gaines? And many of you know the history, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that for those of you who don't know the history, and some of you know the history better than I do because you've been here through it all. But I will uh, give you a little bit of a recap on that. And so today we're here to talk about ideas. We're here to brainstorm. I'd like to get your input. Um, this is not a, a meeting where I'm coming with a solution, a single source solution. I'm saying this is the, the option that we have in front of us. But I am here to talk about the realities that we face and what we've been facing for a while. And so um, if you bear with me, I'm gonna get into kind of the agenda today. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about our recent history uh, with Gaines and some of the things that we've been talking about for a while. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about why we're even bringing anything up at all. What is the problem? I'm going to talk about possible solutions and ideas. I'll, I'll provide you with some information tonight to consider and to think about. And probably the most important part are question, comments, and input. I'm going to want your input I'm going to be sharing this with our board. Um, this is being videoed. They will get a copy of the video. We'll post the video as well. Um, but we'd like to start to generate a brainstorm. So what ideas do you have? And after I share some of the data with you, I would like you to be able to do something that's very, very challenging. And the very challenging thing that I'm going to ask you to try and do is to put yourself into uh, the position of a non-parent, non-gains community member. And that is a really difficult thing to do, to try and say, how do I look at this data and look at this situation as objectively as possible? And there's a lot of things to consider here. It's not just about enrollment. There's a lot, there's a lot at stake. And so we want to talk about those from a variety of facets. And then I'll talk a little bit about what our next steps are. And, uh, and certainly we'll be around for additional questions if we need to. So I want to talk a little bit about the recent history. And so prior to my arrival in 2016, back in 2015, there was a committee that was established. There was a conversation that started around, you know, the, the enrollment at Gaines Elementary School has dipped to about 235 students. It's not, a, it's not efficient. I'm sorry, I'm trying to stand in a place that maybe those microphones being turned off would help. I don't know. Oh, OK. Um, we're, at the time, the conversation was, you know, this is the option. We need to close Gaines Elementary School because it doesn't necessarily make sense from a financial standpoint to keep running it. It's, a, it's an inefficiency, so on and so forth. Okay? At that time, uh, we had about 235 students, between 9 and 10 teachers, plus support staff and a principal. Um, that discussion... Uh, continued in 2015 and then towards the end of 2015 the Board of Education voted no on closing Gaines Elementary School they said we're not going to close it but we told they told the residents at that time many of you know this you were there I wasn't there so you know it better than I do I'm just kind of trying to provide a context here they said hey if this enrollment doesn't look differently in the future we're gonna have to come and revisit this and that was really the end of the discussion. I started in the district in 2016, so it was after this had happened. And uh, in that time, we have had no discussion whatsoever about closing Gaines Elementary School. 
In the last five years, our conversations have been around how do we try to be as efficient as possible? What are the different opportunities that we could see out at Gaines? We've um, added some different innovative practices. We've had to try and be as efficient as possible, um, but we've maintained a very open and supportive approach to keeping Gaines open. And here has been our argument. The argument is, right, and most of you know this, if you would have closed Gaines Elementary School, you're going to lose a large number of the students that come here that are going to go to Byron or you know neighboring districts. And that's going to then mean that ultimately, you're really not going to be saving much money, if any money, by closing the building. So I've been a very ardent supporter of Gaines Elementary School. There are people who will have different emotions about the fact that we're even discussing this tonight, but I will tell you, this is the first time that this has been discussed since I've been here, and I've been a very big supporter, okay? I still am a huge supporter, and I don't like any conversation about having to make difficult choices around buildings or closing or any of those types of things. And that's not the only option here tonight, but what I do have to say is we've seen a consistent enrollment decline in the last five years. And over the past couple years, that enrollment has dipped to a point that now we are projecting at, at most 120 students in the building for next year. That's almost half of what we had back in 2015 when this was last discussed. So as huge a supporter I am, and as big of an ardent support I am of keeping everybody fully functioning, there does come a point where I'm not doing my job if I don't at least engage people in a conversation around what can be done. Because this is not heading in a direction that appears to be a positive trend. And there are a myriad of factors for that. Some of you have some things that I'm sure you'll be able to share tonight to, to speak into that. But when you go from you know, almost a 50% reduction in the last five years in enrollment, the conversation has not changed from back in 2015. In fact, it's only gotten worse. And so from that perspective and that data point alone, we need to discuss this. So um, one, of the, one of the conversations uh, that we need to say is, then what is the problem? Why can't we just run the building at 120 kits? Running a building under capacity, okay, which that would be significantly under capacity, leads to inefficiencies and inequities across the entire district. We have between 3,600 and 3,700 students in the school district, and so a decision potentially to keep a building open for 100 to 120 students has a drastic impact on the other 3,600 students. And so my role is to advocate for all students and so sometimes that means advocating for the Gaines students all the time, every time, but I'm also advocating for Deke students and Cyrene students and Morris students. And that is something that can be very challenging to hear as I'm here to talk about representing the entire district. So the problem is when my argument about, you know, you're going to lose students and this and that, when you run projections, that, that argument send, tends to have a lot less of an impact when you're seeing numbers of like 120 students and then we're talking about how do we actually even run the building at that point and have an efficient model. Okay, so that's the big problem. We're seeing class size variants of 12, sometime, projecting next year possibly 12 students in some classes. And it's very difficult to compare that to an inequity across the district where somebody might have 26, 27 kids in the same grade level. So when you consider those, those variances, that's, that's very, very difficult to, to accept. Um, split classes. One of the options you have at Gaines, and we've done this in the past five years, I know, and it's not been popular amongst some of our families, is we've had to say the only way we can make this work, we got 12 kids in this grade and 12 kids in this grade, they have to be a split class. Well, for those students, they're not getting the same experience that their peers at Morris or their peers at Deke are getting because those kids are having one teacher for one grade level. It's not the same experience that those children are getting that they're getting across the district. So that's another issue. Um, when you only have 120 students in a building, you don't have the ability to provide full support and opportunities uh, for programming. 
And that's something that also creates a little bit of a problem because now kids at Gaines may not have the same opportunities as kids across the other parts of the district have. And the other thing it leads to is tremendous inefficiency in our staffing. When we have split staff that we have to say, you're either teaching multiple grades or go out there to Gaines for one day a week and then you're over here for four days a week, that's not a real efficient model for them and it's, it's, it's not easy. You lose efficiency when you have people traveling across the district like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about, so what are some possible ideas? My ideas are not the ideas. They're just some ideas to generate a conversation. I have five. This is not a binary choice where it's like, do nothing or close the building, right? There's a variety of things in between. And so I'm going to share with you some possibilities. I have run financial projections with our finance manager on these things so I can share some data with you on what that might look like. But this is just the starting point. There's going to have to be further conversation, and that's why I'm here tonight is to hear from you because we genuinely want to understand what ideas you have, or better yet, what in our, if you were in our situation, what would you think would be appropriate? What would you recommend? And that's, and that's part of why we're having this conversation here tonight. So let's talk about some possible ideas before we start rolling into uh, you know, getting comments and suggestions from you. So idea number one is to fully staff and run gains. Now, I'm calling this the no change scenario, but in fact, it would result in a change. And this, this is going to get a little confusing. Um, this year during COVID, we did not have a fully staffed building here. And the reason for that is because we had a number of kids that were online. We had a number of kids that were you know, in different modalities. And so as a result, we were able to kind of say, OK, COVID year, crazy year, across the district, our staffing was a little bit wonky because we didn't fully staff every building in person because we didn't have all of our kids in person. Next year, and this is a really good thing, the majority of our families are saying, we want normal school, we wanna go back to school. And so we're planning a full return to school next year as it has been prior to this past year. So as a result of that, um, we're going to have to actually, if we were gonna, fully staff the building according to what our projections would be, we would actually have to add staff, about two and a half staff actually, to this building, which is going to result in about a $287,000 add to our budget that we're looking at for next year because right now we're trying to staff according to what we know we have. So how would this, this is going to be looked at through four lenses. The first one is how would this idea impact students or the community? Okay, that's the first lens. So for GAIN students, they'd have the opportunity to benefit from extremely low class sizes and the opportunity to continue in the building. In, addi in addition, the GAINS Village fully realizes their largest community asset, right? So in this scenario, no change, everything stays the same, and we skip along um, happily because everything is what it is, okay? And for the kids here at Gaines, it's a great thing. I mean, who doesn't want to have classes of 12 kids? You know, that's a, that's a, that's a dream, right? So that's good. How would this, what data supports this idea? Well, there's a lot of data that could be put up there, but the first one is very low discipline data. When you see uh, Gaines Elementary School and those numbers of classes that are down, you might have a child that's acting out, but as a teacher, you can nip that in the bud really quickly because you have so, mu so many fewer kids that you have to address. So low discipline data is a, is a really important thing, and we look to that. Very high performing school. So it's a, a blue ribbon school. It's a school that has done very well. So there's a lot of data that supports the fact that look at these low class sizes, everything's great, and that, that's a positive thing. Um, so there's some significant data that would support that decision. What are some of the possibilities that could happen with this idea? That's the third lens. So it's how does this impact kids in the community? The second lens is what's the data that supports this idea? The third lens is what are some possibilities that could happen with this? Well. Lots of small groups for GAIN students, right? There's opportunities to do lots of smaller knit, tight knit groupings, things that GAINS has been accustomed to. Tremendous ratio of staff to students. And we can continue to pilot innovative ideas. There's a lot that you can do when you have, you know, that number of staff in a building to try some pilots and innovative projects, which is, which is a fully uh, amazing opportunity. 
The fourth lens is, what are some of the drawbacks that could come with this idea? This, this idea would cause the district to add two and a half additional staff due to class breakdown. Um, it would create an inequity with other elementary schools in the district. And there is a tremendous cost to the district when you're running any of your buildings in the red. So from a financial standpoint, none of our buildings should ever even come close to running in the red. And what that means is the amount of staff, the amount of operational costs, the amount of everything that you're pouring into that building, okay, you can't run it in the red because you have a lot of other things that support the overall district work. So think about, you think about the way that transportation works, you think about our operation and maintenance costs, you think about just general uh, school oversight. There's a lot of different pieces that are paid for out of a school. And so if you're running any individual building in the red, it's a significant problem because now you're gonna have to offset that from somewhere else, okay? And so, there's a lot of positive to this idea, okay? And this is probably, and I'm just going to take a stab in the dark, most people who are attending here tonight, this is like, good, we can go home after this idea, right? But the idea here is there is some significant drawbacks, and a large number of them, and why we're talking about it, are financial. So these are financial impacts. So this is strictly for this idea if we were to do nothing, okay? Okay? Or, or to add these staff members back in. It cost the district about $1.1 million to run Gaines Elementary School, okay, on a yearly basis. And so I'm gonna go over a couple of these uh, items. These, this slide is gonna look the same for all five ideas, so you'll kinda get the picture, so I won't have to do this every time, but just so you're aware, our revenue, we're using a baseline of $8,111 per student. That's our state allocation for pupil funding. We will likely get more than that, but we don't know that yet, so we're comparing apples to apples. So at this time, we're using our 2019 number because that's the last time we had somewhat of a normal year. And so we're using that projected revenue number. We had 139 students at that time, okay, in 2019. And so we brought in, revenue-wise, about $1.1 million, okay? $1.1 million. And so next year, at our projected 120 students, which is a, is a loss of 19 kids from that 2019 year, we're looking at about a $973,000 revenue stream, which is a loss of about $154,000. So what that, this part of the slides will all look the same because that's our revenue. That's the money we take in to be able to fund running the school. Now, as I get into scenario one, these are the specifics to this scenario. We are projecting if we fully staff the school, we're not going to lose any of those 120 kids. All 120 are coming to the building. We're going to fully run everything that we are. I mean, we would have to assume and count on that, right? I mean, that would be a huge win. So we're, we're in this scenario, we're counting on no loss of students. So as a result of that, we have our 120 students. That's that 973000 in our revenue column. Now you come down here to expenditures. This is what it costs to run the building, okay? And as you look at our instructional programs, our special education supports, our other support staff, our media center, our administration and other supports, our operations and maintenance, which is really an estimate only. It's very difficult to break out our consumers' bills. I can tell you that it's ranged between $35,000 and $60,000, okay? So we're targeting about a $50,000 um, uh, maintenance and operation cost. Um, or, I'm sorry, yes, maintenance and operation cost. And then community education costs, there, there's no money that we would need to allocate for that. So in the event that we were to run no change, okay, it's going to cost the district $1.1 million, but the worst part of that is we are now running a deficit building in the red at a, to the tune of about $113,000, all right? So what that means is there's no additional money. In fact, we're having to take money from other places to effectively run this operation to the tune of $113,000 a year, which compounds to a lot of money over time. It's actually significantly more when you consider uh, this number on what it takes to fund the building, but I'll get into that later. So from idea one, there's a lot of positive. And by the way, we don't need to make a decision 
at any point solely based on numbers. We make decisions on a lot of reasons. Many of the reasons to look at idea one is the community impact, looking at the student impact for the gain students in particular, okay? So there's a lot to like about idea one, but I'm gonna go through a few different ones. Okay, idea two is running gains with splits. In order to do this, we could run gains next year with a K-1 split, a 2-3 split, a fourth grade, and a fifth grade classroom. That's the way that the numbers shake out in terms of running uh, our classes, all right? So I'm gonna go through the same four lenses now, okay? Lens number one, how would this impact our kids in our community? Well, from the community standpoint, the great news is the building would remain fully open, so it remains a community asset, everybody's able to you know, still send their kids to school. Students would have a class size more like their peers across the district. So you're not gonna see the class sizes of 12 or 14, they're gonna be more similar to what a normal elementary class is for that grade level. And students would have to learn in a split class format. And this would likely not only remain the norm moving forward, it probably wouldn't change indefinitely because what you're gonna see is you're not gonna have enough numbers to support any single grade level classes in the future. So eventually you would be moving to, depending on the enrollment trend, maybe even Little House on the Prairie, run one room schoolhouse kind of a thing where you have a teacher with five grade levels, which we contractually couldn't even do. So this right here though, would provide at least an option in the short term to say, we could run this, the, the kids would be there, um, they would have to be in a split class, but it keeps the building open for the community's sake. What data supports this? Well, there's a lot less financial strain in the district budget. There's a lot better efficiency in terms of balancing students across grade levels, so there's less inequities across the district in terms of the different buildings. Um, and there's, uh, for some students, there's data that shows that learning in a multi-age classroom can show some benefits, all right? What are some of the possibilities that could happen with this? Well, number one, you can do some pretty innovative things with a multi-age classroom in terms of advancing kids and bringing kids around and shuffling them between you know, different groups. Um, there's gonna be more district-wide supports and opportunities because there's less strain on the financial side of things when you're running more of an efficient model like this. So across the district, there would be more uh, financial resources to do a few different things. So then what are the drawbacks that could come with this idea? Well, there are challenges, challenges to teachers and kids in a split classroom model. Um, some kids do not fare very well in a multi-age classroom or I'm trying to teach my third grade group and the kids are being so noisy over there that the, the second graders aren't, you know, they're, they're, the third graders are being distracted by the second graders. That creates some challenges for teachers in a split classroom. This will also likely result in some loss of students and families. There will be some parents, families, maybe in this room who would say, if that's what you're doing, I don't wanna be a part of it. I don't want my kid to go to that type of a class. So now you have an issue because you're gonna compound the situation where you're, you're gonna be losing um, some additional students. So let's look at the financials for this idea. Revenue is the same, okay? In this scenario, we are projecting that we would lose about 10 students. Th these are throwing darts at a dartboard. I mean, I can't tell you exactly what's gonna happen, otherwise I would be retired and making a lot more money, but the point is, I can't promise you what would happen, but I think in this type of scenario, you'd have to expect that you're gonna lose some families. So we're projecting in a split model, you probably lose about 10 kids. So now you're gonna have a revenue of 892,000 because of the fact that you only have 110 students in the building. These numbers right here, the instructional program, a lot of those stay similar to what it would be in a fully run school, okay? So your total, there's some, there's some less costs in your instructional staff because you don't need as many teachers, okay? So um, 574,000 in your instructional program, that still runs the building in the red, but like $100,000 less, okay? So now you're looking at $22,000 to the red versus 118,000 or 13,000, whatever that was. So, the financial impacts to number two are far less to the district than idea number one. All right, so again, pros and cons to each of these. 
That's one possible idea. Idea number three, run gains as a 3-5 building only. When I've run this idea by some staff and, and some families, I've increasingly got the, don't even talk about that one, that's stupid. So I already had it in my presentation, so I'm going to show it anyway, um, but I won't spend a lot of time dwelling on it. The reason why I don't think this is as popular is because I think what happens is you're really not solving a problem, you're just de delaying the inevitable, okay? And that's not a place where people get excited about. But in this type of a model, you would basically have the ele early elementary kids go to the other two early elementary schools in the district. The upper elementary school students that are here would be able to stay and finish out here at Gaines. Um, this would keep the building open, at least temporarily. Um, obviously, again, low discipline data, opportunity to collaborate with some of the other upper elementary schools. The possibilities of this, um, more resources and supports across the district. It would provide an opportunity for a longer transition in a closure situation versus making it more abrupt. So in some situations, you might say this would like soften the blow for a year, especially for the kids that or families that had kids that were already in the building. All right, we're going to we're going to do this for for one more year or two more years. Um, the drawbacks are this only addresses the issue temporarily. All right, so that's that's the main drawback. Likely would lose students. You know, you're going to be losing kids in this type of scenario as well. So again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. We're projecting at least a 15 pupil loss in this scenario. Okay, it sounds weird because we don't actually have 105 students that would be coming here in a 3-5 model. Um, but those students would likely go to other buildings, right? So when you're looking at your revenue, you're looking at it in the totality of the district. So in this type of a model, you're looking at about a 15 student loss across the district. Many of the students that were, would be here would not want to stay. So that's 851,000. As you look through this list, you finally get to the, to the black. So now you're operating the building at least it's self-sustaining itself, okay, to a certain level, to the tune of about $82,000, it's, it's fully self-sufficient. Um, again, there, there wasn't in my initial conversations with certain families and people not a lot of excitement around this, but it's an idea, it's a scenario, I brought it up. Idea four is that the building does close but we open an early childhood and community education center at Gaines Elementary School, okay? So what does this idea look like? Um, first of all, the building would remain fully open as a community asset. In fact, you would probably expand community use. Uh, you'd probably start to, we would hire, and we factor this into our financial projections, we would hire a building manager to be out here several days a week to be running pickleball, adult education, computer lab classes, you know, walking, basketball, I mean, you name it, you could create somewhat of a community center on one side. On the other side, we already run Head Start. We could still run Head Start and even add at least one GSRP classroom so you would actually have self-sufficient early childhood programs. That would essentially mean that somebody who's moved here or who lives here that has little ones that are pre-kindergarten pre age, they could benefit from some of those programs. The building stays open. It's, it's not a loss to the community in terms of an asset, okay? The students would be dispersed to other elementary schools in the district. And, and in that scenario, right, you're going to have some things that come with that. So what data supports, supports this idea? Well, there's a tremendous benefit to the district budget. So if you think about operational efficiencies, they're significantly uh, increased and the, the inefficiencies reduced. Um, what are some of the possibilities that could happen? Well, early childhood programming and community education programs be, could become an anchor in the community. So if you did this idea, you could really kind of run with this, have a building manager out here and get more of an actual community uh, center approach for this building. What are some of the drawbacks? Certainly you're gonna lose students in this scenario. There's gonna be families that say, you know, I, I'm just not gonna send my students to another school. We're gonna go elsewhere. Um, students would be attending an elementary school further away in some cases. 
And I say in some cases, and this may be an unknown fact, but there's actually a decent number of kids who are further away from some of the other elementary schools than they are from Gaines. So with that being said, there's, there are some positives to this one and some not so positive things as obviously all of the ideas have. This all looks identical to the others. With this exception, we're projecting that in this scenario, we would lose about 35 students, which means that now the number of kids is about 85, so your revenue comes down to 689. So your revenue drops, obviously, if you don't have as many students. All right, but the significant impact here, we still would have some special ed supports, some administrative and uh, you know, support staff um, cost, because those people would be allocated to other places around the district, right? So if students are going to other buildings, you would have some of those people allocated to other places. Now, there's going to be about a $30,000 cost to run a building manager out here to run the community education program if it was a center like that. And you're going to have some increased operation maintenance costs because of the fact that you're probably going to have some construction uh, out here to kind of help outfit the building more to a community center that it would need to be. But the big swing here, remember uh, when we talk about you know, what it costs to run the building, instead of being 1.1 million, you're now talking about 232,000. And when you look at the revenue loss and everything in totality and you look at a full analysis, the district is now $457,000 to the good. You know, so that equates district-wide to a lot of things. And that can mean a lot of things for, for all of the students in the district, gains as well. Um, but obviously that comes at the expense of the building not operating as a K-5 building during the school day. Okay? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because I know it's not going to be the most popular, but I am going to talk about it because it's on the end of the continuum from doing nothing to fully closing. Um, so close gains completely. That's the fifth idea. Um, how would this impact the students of the community? The building would close and be maintained with heat in the winter and security, but would not be open so community would lose that asset. Um, students would also be dispersed to other elementary schools just like the previous idea. The financial impact is the greatest, allowing many other possibilities across the district. Um, what, are, what could be some possibilities here? More support and educational opportunities for all kids across the district. So now again, it, in making this decision, you'd have the most available financial support across the district. And then what are some of the drawbacks that could come with this? Well, this would be a significant change to the Gaines community in, in a not so positive way. Um, certainly it would result in the loss of some students and students would be attending other elementary schools in some cases further away. And so obviously there are some significant drawbacks to that. I'll get into the financial impacts. Um, first of all, we're, again, if you close the building K-5, you're going to lose, we're projecting about 35 kids. That changes this number again, so your overall revenue is down. Um, similar scenario here, minus the community ed costs and a couple other things. You're looking at about $147,000 uh, to, to operate the building at, and it's, it's really a little bit of a misnomer, but just to kind of keep the building running. And that would yield about a $542,000 addition to the district budget for other things across the district. So those are, um, those are five ideas. They're not the ideas. There are other ideas. And so what I tried to do was give you a little bit of a picture. And I ran the gamut from here's some ideas that are from doing nothing, which, you know, I don't know that I can recommend that. And I also don't know that I can recommend the other end of the spectrum, but there needs to be some conversations around what we do with this information, right? What, what would you as a Gaines community expect, hope for, look for in this type of scenario? So um, what I'm going to do right now is, I, I guess, depending on how easy this is, I'm going to take, I'm going to walk around and I'm actually going to just take this off for a second. And I'm just going to stand next to you and you can ask your question into the microphone so that everybody can hear the question. So I'd like to entertain either questions about any of the five scenarios. If you need me to flip back to a slide, I can do that. I would also entertain, at this time, uh, input. So 
What about this idea? Have you thought about this idea? Is Principal P in here? You going to be able to take notes for me? Okay. Uh, that would be good. Yep. And then the other, the other piece would just be if you'd like to make a comment, I'm happy to take comments. Um, I, I started this meeting by saying this is not a binary choice. I'm not coming in here to say this is what we're doing. But it is my job to talk about the all students in the district. And if I'm talking about all students in the district, I can't ignore some of these facts. And so now we are having this conversation and I want to genuinely ask for your input. And if you have questions, comments, or you want to make a, you know, a suggestion, I'd love to hear it. So um, if you just want to raise your hand, I'll try and come to you and you can ask your question or make your comment. So. Hi, my name is Melissa Neal. Uh, I've been at this school, I've had students in the school since 2011. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of time if you don't mind. That's okay. fine, I just okay. uh, can't take this off, sorry. Okay, I have a timeline that I've put together throughout the years. 2011, we moved to this district. There were about 300 students in this school. I had a second grader. 2012, I registered my third grader, and I mentioned this. They changed boundary lines in 2012. My, third, my kindergartner was now supposed to go to Deke. So that might be something we want to look into is why were those boundaries? I understand that yes. Seymour Road, some of those students would be closer to go to Cyrene, but as a parent and as most of the parents, we chose to still bring our kids here, even though, and I realize that was not on your tenure. Sure. That those lines were changed, and they, all those children from Seymour to Grand Blank Road north now I'll go to Cyrene instead of coming here. That's when our numbers started dwindling. That's when they started showing they're going to close the school. They've got plans for it. I understand that was not under your time. Mm -hmm. um, 2012, they moved the lines. 2016, we, won a blue, we were a Blue Ribbon school. We were 13th in this state of the best test scores. The next year, a lot of our teachers left. I don't know whether it was of their own accord or whether they were moved. I don't have that information, and that's fine. 2017, we were still at 235 students. We fought that fought, and many of you fought right, not, right next to me, right beside me. We did that fight. Um, we sat at 224 in 2018. Parents do not send their children to a school that they continuously hear, it's gonna close, it's gonna close. Why are, when are they gonna close that school? So we continuously lost numbers. Again, last year, boundary lines were changed. We lost eight families out of the school last year. So, as a parent, as a resident, as a business owner, as a staff of this school, I kind of feel we're set up for failure. Maybe if we're going to rearrange lines to send more schools to other kids to other schools, why can't we rearrange those lines and send them here? If they've t and I like I said, I understand they're closer. I get it. Mm -hmm. um, hold on, I got more more notes. Magnetic school. We talked about a magnetic school at one time. Mm -hmm. um, do you do you want to? Do you want me to just come back and like, you can, I don't want to cut you short. So do you want me to address some of these and then I'll come back yes. and then you can take the next one? Does Thank that work? You. Okay. All right. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know oh, Melissa, that was great. I know Melissa and she'll have lots to add. So, and I, and I appreciate that. So, um, here's, here's a couple thoughts to consider. I don't know the deep history around boundary lines changing. I've heard that in talking, not just with you, Melissa, but many of the parents that have been out here, okay? The boundary lines have changed, the boundary lines have changed. I don't know what happened in 2012. According to our transportation department, okay, and there are people in that department that have been here for 25 years, there has been no significant redrawing of the lines since in, in the last 25 years. What she will tell you Okay, now, and I'm, I'm getting a lot of nods like, no, that's not true. Okay, I'm, I'm sharing, I'm the messenger here, but I will give you another couple thoughts to this point. What I will tell you is that she did say there were some situations where there was a subdivision or, uh, you know, a road that, you know, was closer and so it made more sense to do uh, this or that, but we've also expanded gains territory in other areas. Here's one thing to consider because I know that this has happened since I've been here. When we went to the elementary uh, reshuffle, we created a more simplistic boundary line. And the simplistic boundary line was Morris Road. So Morris Road cuts the district almost exactly down the center. And so Gaines maintained their geographic area, but what we said was any of the people that are you know, east of 
Morris Road would go to the east side schools, okay? We actually have a small handful of families who live on Grand Blank Road on the east side of Morris Road who come to Gaines, okay? Most of those families still come to Gaines. And so what I would suggest to you, and I know this to be true, a lot, because I've had the conversations with the families, in many cases, we even bust them out here even though they're not in that new boundary. Secondly, to that point, when we opened up the elementary model, this was an unintended consequence. We had a number of Gaines families saying, I want my kids to go to that model. And so the question was then, do we force someone <laughs> and say, no, you can't come, you have to stay there. That's a difficult thing to do. Um, we have not, and I have actually heard conflicting reports on this to my knowledge, and I can't speak for the 500 employees we have because people say things all the time, but certainly from our office, we have never supported the notion that if you want to come and bring your kid to Gaines, that you can't come here. We've absolutely supported that, and in some cases, as I said, we even pick people up that are not even close and bring them here. Because why? Why would we not want to try and create more efficiency? I mean, it would be great if we could run 24, 25 out here. The unfortunate reality when you talk to families is while there are some that would like to drive their kids or be bussed out you know, from a five minute drive to a 25 minute drive, there's not a lot. A lot of families say, I wanna be five minutes from the school, not 25 minutes from the school. And there's just not as much population density in this geographic area. So I can't speak to you know, what they did in 2012. I've been told that there have been some slight revisions, but we've always allowed people to come here or continue, continue to come here on whether, if they wanna to continue to do that. And that's, that's been a part of the conversation uh, that I know I've had since I've been here. So you know, I, I don't know that I could say that we've had some sort of redrawing lines which have caused this you know, because if somebody was redrawn, even if that were true, and they said, well, I still want to go to Gaines. Okay, you can still go to Gaines. So, you know, I, I know we lost people because kids wanted to go, parents wanted their kids to go to the early and upper model, L model. That did happen, and that was not an intended consequence, but that, that in fact, did happen. We pick up a fam several families on Grand Blank Road, and we bring them out this year. We, we bring them all the way, on, and they're in the Morris side. So I know we're transporting. So I don't... I think that there's probably, the truth lies somewhere in the middle. There's a belief that the district is nefariously changing all the lines. I don't believe that's true. It's never been my experience. And there's also probably a belief that you know, nothing's ever been changed, and I'm not sure that that's true either. I, I just, I don't know where that's at. I don't know that that's the root cause of a 50% reduction in enrollment. I don't believe that either. So um, it's, it's a good point and it's a good thing for us to consider and we need to be cautious about that. Um, but you had other things you wanted to say. I only have one more and you can leave that on because I've got a... I've, you got a projecting voice, okay. So yep. So is that talking to the office table and if you don't know what it is, may not know if you want to tell them what that is. Yeah, so I think that's one of the... Can you write that um, ideas? This is one of the ideas that we started with um, two years ago. And what we said was, what if we, instead of running um, uh, just like a normal elementary program, we would run like uh, innovative, we, Katie, what did you call the farm thing? It was the far, uh, modern ag. Modern ag. So we said, what if we started a modern ag program? I know it would be, we know it would be really popular out here. So we started that program. We started to run integrated specials with kids instead of, you know, running like just the, which we could have done, just run the run of the mill. We said, let's run integrated specials. STEM will be a part of that, which just so you know, the whole district is shifting to more of an integrated approach that started here at Gaines two years ago. So that was one of those magnet pilots to say, come to Gaines, try to do the modern ag program. You're gonna get a totally different, more of a dynamic, holistic, integrated educational experience. Um, and, and so we did, we tried that. Um, again, we just haven't seen, maybe it hasn't been enough time, but we haven't seen the fruits of that, you know, in terms of people coming out. The other piece to, uh, th so to add to an idea that hasn't been tried, sometimes a magnet school means you're trying to run like a, like a gifted and talented program, right? Um, 
that is an absolute idea that we should put on the table. We are doing that in our cluster program through our early and upper elementary model. So that's, that is something that is going to be happening at the other buildings, which is going to create a situation where it's like, we can do that here, but it's not necessarily going to be com completely and entirely unique to gains. And so I think it's a good idea. I, I also talked to somebody who, along these same lines, thought about, and some people are going to just cringe when they hear me say the word, but there's this uh, program that runs in Grand Blank, and it's almost like a Montessori school. It's like a, like a K-7 Montessori type school. And so what if gains became like, a Montessori type philosophy and we tried that type of a program. Um, there's people in this room and also people that are here that would say I'm not signing up for that but at the same time you know that would be another idea maybe that would draw people so I, we are very open to whatever ideas that you have and so I think that idea of a magnet school is good to resurface and talk about I mean I, I do think that's valid. I don't need it. Okay. All right. Good deal. So, talk, speaking of the magnet school, would that also include something like, like what Davison did, where they had one elementary building that was the balanced calendar? And if the students want to do, I mean, yeah. We thought of offering something like that. Yeah, for sure. So that would be another good idea. So um, Davison started with an elementary school. To your point, they ran this. They run a balanced calendar, which basically has not been super popular in Swartz Creek. When I've done um, focus groups with parents and I've talked with the board members, that has not gotten a lot of traction. But what Davison did, it didn't get a lot of traction in Davison either. What they did is with one elementary school, they started a balanced calendar. They threw that on the table. The parents ended up loving it and they said, the other elementary schools started saying, we want to do that. And so now actually the whole district runs on a balanced calendar. So ideas like that are great. So I think we need to have that on our list of ideas. You know, so that's, thank you. Great idea. Do you want this? You good? OK. Well, this is, th that, that's what this is all based on, is looking at next year. Because we do have postings out there for teachers. Right, and so in the fall, well, summer really, we look at hiring our staff that we have, you know, that have retired and things like that. We also, when we do staffing, I think I mentioned this earlier, but this year we did not have all of the staff that we will need to run a full face-to-face -face program because we had kids that were, you know, you, our online teachers taught more kids than a face-to-face -face teacher does, right? You, you have a, a, a higher threshold. So we're gonna have to hire staff. So part of this equation and these numbers are based on the fact that we've got staff members that could be hired or not be hired based on the direction that we end up going with gains, right? Um, just another comment. I have an incoming kindergartner and a fifth grader, so I have both ends of the spectrum. Sure. If you keep on talking about closing the store, the school, I don't know if I want my kindergartner to start here. Mm -hmm. A thing to consider, since you might be starting this next year, is possibly closing the school when the incoming kindergarten class goes into third grade where they would automatically intermix with the other kids. So it wouldn't be <coughs> another transition. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't transition at first grade or second grade and then again at third. Yep. Yeah. So something like that where you wouldn't take any incoming K-1 and 2 until this class was out and then, then you would do whatever you want with this building. Interesting. So um, that would be basically like running an early L or having it run, um, you know, not moving to closure until this year's kindergarten class was out. Um, so that's, a, that's another good idea. And, uh, and I will speak to just one comment that you made. Um, the last time that this was talked about from the district's perspective was back in 2015. And I've been here. So I know that to be the case. In fact, I've been to businesses in Gaines who were telling people, I've actually fought for Gaines, going into businesses that were telling people, don't go to Gaines, they're going to close it, two years after that discussion was put to bed. Right. And I said, why are you saying that? To give you some backstory, I moved here in 2016. That's when I bought my house up here. Mm -hmm. He was going into kindergarten, and I had family who lived in who said, Gaines is closing. Right. And then during that time, it was part of the drama. It hadn't been settled. That's when they came during a blue ribbon school, and then it sounds like to me, as an outsider who has not been in this area, that this is a redheaded stepchild that no one likes. So let me give you just. I don't see any marketing to try and get people in. I don't see any reason, like, 
have you done any polls why at least 20 students have gone? I think that was the people that we lost to the border, which wasn't necessarily a huge number, but that's like our only loss of students from me. I thought I heard only nine were lost to the families. families. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the people in here are going to agree to disagree. I can tell you that formally the district has never taken the approach that we're closing games. If anything, it's been the opposite. But the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is, when you look at this, this trend, it's, it's actually irresponsible. I mean, when do you talk about it? So if it was talked about, which, again, I wasn't, I wasn't a fan of it. I wasn't in support of it. But if you talk about 235, okay, so when's the next time that you talk about it? Do you talk about it when that number's 200 or when that number's 180? or when that number's 150, or when that number's 100. I mean, we, there's, where's that line where you have to at least say, hey, everyone, this issue hasn't gone away. And so we are running at an operational deficit and deficiency, in inefficiency across the district. I don't say the option is just to close gains, but we, we have to talk about this at some point. I understand what you're saying. Well, if you talk about it, then no one's going to come. We haven't talked about it formally for five years. So. It's, it's absolutely wrong, and I cannot control, I don't have any jurisdiction to control their superintendent and say, you're not allowed to do that. I mean, we can say that, but we have done that. And we've actually... I mean, I don't live in the village. Can anyone ask the family why they choose Byron over Schwarzkopf? We have, and we've actually called people that have switched and have left, and some of those reasons are difficult to talk about. Some of those reasons deal with a myriad of things. Um, I will say, to your point, you know, we heard it's going to close, right? They, that's the, the, what they're hearing. And so that was part of it. And so I agree with you. I, I think that that's a factor. Um, that's not the main factor. Uh, we lose a large number of our kids going to the middle school. Most of our kids do not end up graduating, not most, a chunk of our kids, a good chunk, do not ever go to sixth grade at Swords Creek. They end up going to Byron. I'm not going to lie. I'm most likely going to put in there. <laughs> when you started, I gave them Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're going all the way to Linden. I can. The only reason that I've had both my kids so far going to games next year is because they can be in the same school together. Mm -hmm. I don't see any advertisements on other schools. I mean, Linden is literally like a mile away from my house. I don't see any advertisements for Linden families to possibly come here because they're lower paid kids or lower on my yeah, and, and I appreciate the thought. So let's start with an idea about advertising. I will tell you there's, there is a little, I, I don't know how to say this. It's not going to satisfy what you're asking, but let's just say if Carmen came into our district and started going around and passing out flyers in our district, or what Byron does, it quite frankly is a very, very negative thing. It, it creates a lot of bad blood. So we don't typically go into other districts and try and recruit people. Um, we do have more kids coming to us than leave us, but at the same time, that, that is not, we do marketing, but it is not usually something where we're going out into other communities and trying to pull kids away. That's just, right, wrong, or indifferent, that's just something that I exists. I that, but why is there even a flyer that parents themselves could share? I mean, I'm on a, little, a lot of groups that have families from all over, and if I'm advertising for my elementary school that I think is good, then maybe they'll possibly be yeah, I, I think that's I think that's a good idea. So let's add advertising and maybe even uh, something for parents to use for those advertising things. I just have a statement. So I, the, the virus has bothered me for years. I will say, and I don't know if anybody knows this, the virus, they, they draw a fine line. They actually don't come across the Shire Wazi Medicine County Board. So I believe that is it's right here. Yep. So technically, they're staying within their jurisdiction because they're not coming into game, whether that's right or wrong. For sure. Yeah. Okay. We got multiple. So let's start here. Do you want this, or are you good? No. I'm okay. Good. 
Okay, um, I want to make a little correction to yeah. something you said earlier. Sure, please. You said that the school buses will pick up kids on Grand Blank Road east of Moorish. They will if you transfer your kid west of Moorish. I am on Grand Blank Road east of Moorish. Okay. okay. My son should be going to Alms Moorish. We chose to stay at Gaines. Yep. And we filled out the inter, uh, inter district school of choice. But the busing has us, uh, sent, we can either drive them to school or if we can find a bus stop west of Moorish. So we just happen to have family just west of Moorish. Gotcha. And we allow one other family to yeah. pick, get picked up there. We couldn't allow like a ton of people. Mm -hmm. But I do know, I mean, this is just the people I know, so it didn't go around and like ask anybody. Sure. Much, but a few. They could not do that. They could not find a family to bus with and they could not bring their kids. They had to have busing that came to their house because mm -hmm. of their work situation. And so even though they didn't want to because of their work, they had to do the Elms Moore. Sure. So that was just a couple of families. <coughs> but, yeah. I appreciate the correction and I and I hope I didn't misspeak when we don't always bus out of area, mm -hmm. but that grand blank we you're right, it's west of Morris Road, and if the bus is traveling by there, or they can get to a stop there. Yeah. For example, we would not go up into the north uh, east corner of the district and pick somebody up that wanted to come to Gaines. Yeah, we couldn't make that happen. It sounded but. like we were picking up some of the right. students on Grand Blank Road, just east of the border. Okay. Still, the ones that yep. just got cut off last year. You're right. And that's not true. Yep. We have to drive and go over the border. Thank you. Yes. Yep. Yes, do you want this? Do I need to come down there? You're good. So we do have a fantastic Head Start program. Yep. Here. Wonderful people, love them enough. Does that bring in revenue to our school to help us out? No. No. <clears throat> Head Start is a countywide program. It's run through G-Card. And Head Start, um, basically what we do is we allow them to have, it's, it's almost revenue neutral. We allow them a space but typically those kids that are in Head Start end up being from this community. So it's, a, it's a providing a service to the community. You see the free preschool signs, places. Um, they have every intention and desire to want to come back here. And I think from everyone that I've heard, they've been great. So you know that, that would be good. Um, it isn't a revenue generator. Uh, GSRP, if we were to run GSRP classrooms, to explain funding, just really in a nutshell, everything has buckets. And so the strings that are in those buckets can't be moved around, right? So if we're running a GSRP class, I couldn't say, okay, well, we're getting X amount of dollars for running a GSRP program here, so we can get that and now pay for a third grade teacher. It doesn't work that way. But um, it is providing a service to the community. It keeps the building open. It keeps children in the building, and if there are families that have young children, that becomes a self-sustaining program that does not cost the district in that aspect. Yes, I'm sorry, I don't want to skip anybody. We'll go here and then the next. Um, but having more GSRP classrooms out here, could you use some of that funding for like consumer bills and stuff like that? Yes, okay. yes you could, okay. yep. So when you look at um, offsetting some of those operational dollars, that thirty-five dollars to $50,000, $60,000 a year, roughly, depending on how cold it gets and all that, absolutely, GSRP can offset those costs. Great idea. Yes, sir? Um, I just wanted to touch base on the advertising thing again. Yeah. Um, what if we were to do something more indirect instead of sending out mailers into other districts with TV, radio, that's less in a bigger area, we don't cause any bad blood by sending it directly to families and firing or wherever. Mm -hmm. More indirect, like I work at a dealership, we use radios, we use TV. Mm -hmm. That hits a lot of people. We get a lot from that. Yeah, we advertise, you know, that we were 13, third part staff that we have here. We put kids on there who are saying, hey, I love this school, I love my friends. Yeah. You know, stuff like that. That makes a big difference. Yeah, you know? for sure. Can you add that to advertising, not just direct mailers, but radio spots? You know, TV possibly. Excellent idea. Yes. So, I, because I'm not part of that part of the district, I didn't really pay attention to the K two three five thing. Okay. My remembering it was only a one year trial thing. Is that something we're continuing? Is the K two three five 
going forward? Yes. Okay, so if our kids were to have to bus, where would they go? Like I have a, a fourth grader this sure. year, he'll be in fifth grade. Yeah. He would go all the way to Deek, which is on the other end of Swartz Creek, correct? Well, we're in, so I will address all of those things. So we're in a couple, there's a couple different answers. First of all, we are, this is kind of our, I'm imagining that we're going to have a few other meetings like mm -hmm. this, where there, you know, if there's somebody that can't be here, you know, that we would make more opportunities available for input, let alone gathering more ideas. With that being said, um, we are at least having the conversation that in the event that option four or five were to be the option or something along those lines, that we would allow the Gaines families to choose the direction that they go. So for example, right now, if you were to say the dividing line is Morris Road, right? But you lived east of Morris Road, you would go to the east side of the district. If you lived west side of Morris Road, you would go to the west side of the district. So that's just kind of a blanket statement. So what that means is that if you live west of Morris Road, which most of the Gaines kids do, they would go to Cyrene and then to Deke. And the busing for that, the, the busing cost is almost neutral. So what happens from a transportation side is that the buses travel out empty. They pick the kids up and they follow back towards the building. So they're not zigzagging around. We've had some of those scenarios and projections. We try to keep every kid's bus run down. I mean, it sounds terrible, but there have been in the past kids that had bus rides up to an hour. And so we don't like to see any run go beyond that 60 minutes. And so most of our, our average is about 30. Um, there are some kids that may have a 45, but getting them from here, we do this already for our middle school and high school. And so that would be the direction. So they would come out empty, pick up, and then go towards the buildings. We have a shuttle system, so you could pick if you wanted to drop your child off or if you just wanted them dropped off at a particular building. So for example, let's say you have a fourth grader. You said you had a fourth grader, and let's just say off chance you had a second grader. Both kids would ride together. They would go to Deke first, and then there'd be a shuttle that would take your younger one to Cyrene, so you wouldn't have to worry about that whole piece of it. You could also do a single point drop-off. So you could say, well, I want to drop both. It's closer for me to go to Cyrene. I don't want to go all the way up to Deke. I'm going to drop my kids off at Cyrene, and then the shuttle will take you to Deke, if that makes sense. So that's how we've accommodated that. Um, but for the Gaines families, you might say, well, I really kind of, I visited the schools, and because this has happened, we're going to get this one-time choice, you know, to which place we want to go. And maybe you say, I'd really rather have them go to Moorish, you know, or, you know, if you're on the east side of Moorish Road, you may say, it's closer for us. We're five minutes away from Morris. Let's go to Moorish instead of going to Cyrene Deke. Um, there's more capacity, and, and it's because of this, we're much more efficient in terms of our staffing model. So, but there is more capacity in the whole building at Cyrene and Deke than there is at Morrish and Elms. But there's enough space to cap in capacity to accommodate every single one of the Gaines children if they chose all to go. So that's a great question. So all right, I'm going to go here to Christine, then we'll go here, and then I'll work our way back over here. So. Yeah, so what, I, I just, I've got a number of questions uh, and corrections. Number one, I don't think your dates are correct on the closures. I mean, they, they talk about closing gains, whether it's a formal, I don't know what you mean by formal or official or school board doesn't talk about it. They, they talk about it every couple of years. Um, the most recent one was in, when we had the elections, the school board elections, we had recall. We had a big discussion about the fact that we had a, a written ballot. They were, they were voting, the feet committee, they presented and they had a uh, secret ballot that they were going to do and then they had to throw them out because somebody cheated on the back. I mean, it was ridiculous. So your, your, your recollection of the things that happened before you came or whatever information you were provided isn't accurate. Um, that, I believe, is in 2016 at least, if not 17. The, the one thing that I'll just <clears throat> quickly say to that is you're correct in that I don't know what happened firsthand. I only know what I've been told. So your recollection is going to be much better than mine of that time because you were here. But I can tell you that it is just absolutely inaccurate that the district in any way has talked about closing gains every couple years. People may talk about that. The district has not done that. 
I think you need to talk to some of the people in the district because whether or not they talk about it formally at a board meeting, they talk about it. I mean, that's how the rumor gets started. And this idea that we haven't talked about it in five years, you haven't denied it in five years. The school district hasn't denied it. There's not one time this district has made a commitment that we are not closing games for 10 years or eight years. As she kind of suggested, mm -hmm. that allow the students, make the commitment. We are not going to discuss closing this school for five years mm -hmm. and see if you don't start getting parents. You talked about how transportation costs are almost nil in response to somebody's question. And yet this one says, I have to drive my kids across Morse Road because I can't get the bus to come pick me up. But then you also say, well, we're making arrangements of changing of boundaries doesn't yep. really matter because to they're here to, I mean, yeah. straight answers is number one, the best way to get a, a plan yep. in place. So I've been giving straight answers, but I'll correct a statement that you just said. I said, I didn't say that transportation costs were nil. I said they're neutral. So whether we drive kids out here from other parts of the district or whether we pick up and pull back, that cost is relatively the same. And, so. and the cost would be relatively the same if you drove three houses down to pick up her kids versus making her take the kids across more. Yep. I, I've never heard anything so ridiculous. We had, and that was part of what we talked about mm -hmm. back when we were talking about closing games. And we had an entire subdivision. They would pick them up on this side of the street, but not this side of the street. And they would send them to Siren, even though parents were requesting to come to gate and this is back when we had 200 according to melissa 235 mm -hmm. 242 they wanted to close the school yeah. now that we have 120 which if you go back to your slide here we have enough students and gains to uh warrant having full classes for fourth and fifth grade as i recall yep your slide that's slide. correct but k1 and two, three, we don't have enough students to have a full class. Now that's enrollment under your watch. That means in the last three years, am I doing the math right? Enrollment at Gaines has dropped over 100 students. And now that we're in dire straits, we suddenly have to again talk about how do we fix enrollment at Gaines? Why aren't we talking about it three years ago when it started being a problem, two years ago when it was clearly a problem, and last year when it was clearly a problem. Why weren't we putting things into place to fix it then? We talked about this again, all in 2016 and 17, marketing, advertising. We had a great plan in place. We were supposed to have a, we were a blue ribbon school. Mm -hmm. That is supposed to mean something. And then we, and then we got rid of all of the teachers. Tell me how that makes sense. Tell me how that gives the community confidence in who's running this district. Mm -hmm. It's not. So now we want to scratch our heads and say, wait a minute, all the students are going to Byron or Linden or Lake Fenton? I'm at the point where I don't want my kids going to this district. And they're not even engaged. So in the numbers that you're calculating out about students we're going to lose, Figure in high school and middle school students as well, because yeah. parents in this district, they're sick of it. They're tired of it. Middle school, you said you sent the flyers out to Byron, uh, people that have left games from the village to go to Byron, and it's the middle school that's the problem. One of the issues that they've identified. <clears throat> yep. Okay, so let's close games because we have an issue at the middle school where people don't want to send their kids to our middle school. How does that make sense? How does that fix the problem? Um, I, I know we have a couple other questions. So what I'll tell you is that uh, unequivocally, we have been fixing those things in the middle school. Unless you've been there, it's apples to oranges compared to what it was three, four years ago. So. I'll agree to disagree with you on that. I can't speak to all of the comments that you made, but I mean, we'll 
take all of those things down. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know how to address the accusation. I'm I have been to the middle school, and I've been to the, to the PAC, and I've been to the CAGE, and I've been to Mary Crapel. I've been to all of them. What I don't understand is why is it always gains? I, I has been sucking the money out of this district for 20 years. And we put how much? Millions? Two million dollars in the year that they closed Crapo? We bought new boilers, we bought new windows, we bought new... It goes on and on. The fiscal irresponsibility of this board is staggering. But now you're telling me we need to close the school in this community because we're going to lose $112,000. I'm going to... Yep, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to another question. I will just, again, correct the fact that I didn't say that we need to close this school. In fact, I said there's a variety of options and we need to have conversation about it. So All of your options are leading to the closure of the school, whether it's next year or two years or five years. Again, the best way to save this school and this community is make a commitment to keep it open. Why don't we have a plan in place for all these innovative programs? Why don't we have a Lego program? Why don't we have a robotics program? If we have something that sets us apart, like being a, I don't know, blue ribbon school, mm -hmm. why aren't we capitalizing on that? Why don't we have a community center? You talk about close the school, but make it a community center. Here's an idea. Leave the school open and make it a community center. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a good idea. You can put that down. Add that to option one, community center. To option one, yep. You so. don't have to close it to make it financially or fiscally responsible. You can have pickleball here. It's the only elementary school in the district mm -hmm. with a full-size gym. We used to. I don't know if they still do. We used to have mm -hmm. basketball programs. Yeah. Especially now that the pandemic's over, you can get all kinds of groups. To come Absolutely. To Absolutely. To offset the cost. Yes. Yes, sir. I'm just curious. Are you the only board member here? I'm not a board member. I'm just a superintendent. But the board Chuck member is here. Uh, Chuck is. And uh, secretary, yeah. Oh, okay. I, I didn't know. I'm sorry. I just didn't think there was no sense of urgency for those guys to care about the school either. They weren't. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I, and could you keep saying that I, I, I support not closing the school? And I was just curious on, on the other one, like Chuck, well, how, how do you feel about the school? Uh, He's uh, gone? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's how he feels about the school. Jessica's here. Chuck is a supporter. Right, but I was just curious because they're not here and you're the only one here and it, it just was weird to me that, uh, that this young lady's here also. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't think anybody's. I don't think anybody's ready to. Well, I don't want to speak for them, but it, it doesn't appear that there's a like weighing in on this yet. The the first step is to have a conversation out here, generate ideas, talk about some of these things. I I, I hear what people are saying. Don't talk about it, but I, 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 get, I get it. Stuff, but people have been on the board for a while who yeah. know our frustrations. Who who is right out. Yeah. There is talk in the community. Don't take your kids there because they're going to close. Whether you say it's not that. I agree. That. No, no, I know, I know what you're saying. I, yeah. I agree with that. And whether you say that the board isn't talking about it, well, maybe they're not talking about it with you, but, but they're they talking. Are. They, are. Hmm. they are talking. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If I may. Yeah. I would like to continue listening until the end, but I do have a couple of comments to address some of the things that have been said tonight. But really, as a board member, I'm here. I appreciate the, the conversation as a whole. It is my job to come here and listen, I think, and then try to make the best informed decision for what's in the best interest of our students and the district as a whole. So it's important to me to come here and come to listen to what's being said, what the concerns are. I think, as Ben has said, what ideas have, haven't been put on the table yet. But, you know, oh, I thought about that. That's a great idea. Or there are some misperceptions out there to be able to address those as well. So I don't want you to think that I'm just sitting here and I don't want to say anything. I think it's my job to sit here, as, as at least as far as right now, and I'll have 
and listen, and just a minute to really listen, and formulate some things, and then have a response, in part, but it's not my be all end all response tonight. Right. Sure. We appreciate Thank you. I can mm -hmm. speak for all of us that you're attending. Where is it support? Mm -hmm. yeah. They don't care. They're like, well, it's not a, it's not a priority. You know, I don't know if you been with the district for a long time. I'm, I'm educated. I apologize about that, but this is what what Chris has been saying. It's a fact. Mm -hmm. It's a fact about. I, I talk to the other families, and I'm friends with the other families. They send their kids to to Byron, and it's because the school's going to close. Because they keep talking about it. They go, oh, she's right. Make it a 10 year plan. Hey, we're going to, we're going to all in on games, right? Let, let's help us support it. Mm -hmm. and, and we will, we'll do it. When, in 2016, I'm a, I don't know, I'm just assuming, but I'm a firm believer that they didn't close the school because all the parents were up here screaming, yeah, we took care, we painted, we spent our own money, we painted the building, we made it look sweet. This place looked really good because we did all that. Mm -hmm. and that's why they didn't close the school that. Mm -hmm. So I, I do appreciate you showing up inside and know you're on the board. The other board members should be here taking it all in as well. Mm -hmm. How can you make a decision by the video or you no know, problem showing your belly the whole time? <laughs> or my rear end. Yeah. Not a good not a good picture. Yeah. It's, yeah. Thing is, you can't give a good judgment by, by just the video. You have yeah. to be here. Right, feel about Sure. Sure. Okay, we're gonna go here, then there, then here. So my question is pertaining to the bond board. So there's certain things here at the school, I think AC was one of them, that was supposed to be done. Obviously with COVID, the schedule probably got mm -hmm. finagled. Um, is, that, is that work still has to happen here at the building, correct? It will happen. And obviously whatever happens with this has an impact on that. Okay. Yeah. And then it's because I think one of the things is if we can make sure that the Everyone knows that okay, the work is still happening here. We're showing, the district is showing support. Okay, we're gonna push this through. Cause like we mm -hmm. had a problem this year with heat. All right, we had students basically getting heat exhaustion in the class, where they had to go outside and play water games to stay cool, mm -hmm. cool because it just wasn't good enough that, with the fans that they had. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, if we put forth a little more, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, put forth more information about, say, what the schedule is, getting that stuff done, and showing, mm -hmm. you know, that might help letting people know that, okay, there is some thought of keeping the school open because we still have to pour money into it and get the work done. Because it's kind of pointless to put a lot of work into a building if we're just going to close it. For sure. Would you write a uh, bond uh, future update conversation there? Yes. I had a question about the transportation. Yeah. Um, I hear you saying that you're going to make it work for us to get our kids out to the other schools and maybe we want to go to this school instead of that school. How come we're not putting that effort into making sure the parents who want to put their kids in games but don't because they can't get busing? Why is, why is that ever happening? And why is there not an effort to really get out there and find out what parents would prefer to send their kids to games but aren't because they can't get a bus? Okay. Katie, can you add um, parent survey about uh, Gaines Elementary School and, and put in their uh, elementary choice. That kind of gets to what you're saying. Like, Right, yeah. And I mean, I know I personally have many people in my own family who've driven all the way from practically Corona and Owls to bring their kid here. Mm -hmm. And then other families who want to do that but can't because there's no bus. Mm -hmm. You know, and like, why, why haven't we figured out why, how can we make that work? If you're going to make it work for me who lives in the village and decide, hey, I want my kid to go to Morris, mm -hmm. courses, then why can't we make it work for the kids who live out by Morris who want to be here? That's a great question. Transport between the upper and lower elementary, why can't we do a transport out to Gaines? You, you can do a lot of things. Right? So it's just a matter of where you're putting your emphasis on those things. So I think th these are good ideas. That's kind of why we're here, right? So um, th there is a difference between a shuttle to Deacon, Cyrene, and Gaines and any other building in the district. It, it is a, a longer shuttle, right? So it's not quite the same. But um, to your point, you know, if there were truly, you know, more parents that, we, we do elementary choice requests 
And we don't usually see a lot of people requesting to come to Gaines. That doesn't mean that we have put the necessary, to your point, have we kind of couched that option more, pushed that option more maybe? You know, that's, that's kind of what I'm thinking. You know, what if, the, what if we did a survey of K-5, said, hey, you know, if you had the option, you know, would you, if we could get you there with busing, would you do, you know, would you like to go? I think that's kind of where you're getting at, so. Yeah, like if we could provide transportation, would you still choose sure. school or would you choose games? Yeah. I think you would have to add the before and after school care along with that. Oh, yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I didn't really realize that, that I was sending my kids to sign me next yeah, year for before and after care. Mm -hmm. that's, that's insane. Okay. Mine was along that line. A few years ago, you came to a PTO meeting, and mm -hmm. I asked, how was the split between the different grades going to affect gains? And your answer was it was going to affect gains in a positive way because kids, parents who wouldn't want to split up their kids mm -hmm. could choose to come to gains, yeah. and, that we could pass, and we could advertise gains you know, as the one K through fifth grade For and sure. bring your kids to gains. Mm -hmm. And then if we could get enough parents, we could do a shuttle. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really feel like there was like that advertisement. And maybe some parents just didn't feel comfortable. Even if there was, they didn't feel comfortable without that guarantee that mm -hmm. games was going to stay open. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, so it kind of dovetails to that uh, parent survey. And maybe just add a little asterisk to talk about um, if you want that K-5 experience, you know, yeah. kind of. we said that but you know again to the to the level of the effort right yeah but but no we even when we were doing the elementary model shift we had parents that said is gains an option we said absolutely mm -hmm. it is but that's different than advertising and marketing it right yeah. so that's that's part of what that and, idea is for and, and having a shuttle system like a uh, to to do that yeah so. yeah all right we're gonna go here then here oh boy oh she has i'm sorry okay then we're gonna go here then there Sorry. Sure. I, I want to start by thanking the teachers that are in this room. It's been a heck of a year, and um, you're awesome. I, I love you. I, all the way back, because of course many of you know I'm a second generation mom doing this all over again. And so I see teachers that were here when my kids were here, and teachers that are here now. My children could be split into different schools if they if Gaines was closed. Yeah, yeah, they're different. Grades. Okay, because you know that's a not that's not an option. You can't take and split a family. You're splitting up essentially a family. So it, you would always have to coordinate activities. You could never make me choose. Do I go to my boys or my boys? Mm -hmm. You can't. You know you. Conferences. I think of all the things, the way you get embedded in a school, now you would have to be committed to be embedded into two schools. And if you're working 40 hours a week still, and plus you're raising children and everything, that's huge. That's actually a little bit ridiculous. Um, I love somebody's idea about utilizing the school. Like, why do I drive to Linden for a gym class? Why do I drive to Fenton? For, I mean, there's nothing in Gates. There's kids walking around. There's not a lot of things to do. I mean, and the school building is basically completely underutilized. It has been for the 24 years I've been here. Mm -hmm. As far as what, is there a class? You know, yeah, there's a class. I can go to Swartz Creek for a class. Never once have I been, hey, there's this great class going on right here in the village of Gates. And I think that that would really um, say, you know, like bring in the school. Mm -hmm. And then um, also sometimes I wonder like how much you care about the school. Mm -hmm. Because I see, I go to the playground and there's yellow caution tape because there's equipment that's failing and not getting fixed. And so there's just caution tape there. I think that that looks bad. It not only looks bad, but it makes me think, you know, Okay, great. We're not headed in a good direction here. I'm mm -hmm. my school. Actually, I think that that caution tape was actually put up because there was baby birds in the slide. No, it was broken. The there was okay. there was my husband worked on the equipment. I was told it was because there was baby birds. Okay, in there. no, there and was. Didn't want them hurting the birds. 
Yeah, there was broken school equipment. My <laughs> husband was working with maintenance here, and they were trying to get the parts and the pieces. It was potential for an injury. Um, when he first discovered it, he took it into the school and said, look, this isn't safe, you know, and that the caution tape got put up. Um, I just think that I've never, since I've been here, really felt like there was an investment, mm -hmm. like that Swartz Creek was invested in the Gaines community. Even the Gaines school, especially even when we were like shining, really shining, I felt like it wasn't really that big of a deal or acknowledged. Okay. And I do think that, I mean, when I started having to make a decision about do I take, do I enroll these kids in Gaines? Um, and my, at the time of my daughter's death, my grandson was four and I needed a Head Start program to help him. And so it worked out and I made the commitment to come here. And it's really, really distressing to think of them having another traumatic life experience, which you're losing your school and broken apart from all your friends is traumatic. Mm -hmm. It's just like how tra trauma for a kid that has to move. Mm -hmm. But if you're already dealing with trauma and, and you know, you already have a, a child that's had major issues, it extenuates that so much. Sure. And the help that we've gotten here, because we are smaller and they're able to give us that help throughout COVID or from the beginning when we when I enrolled the children, and the personal commitment that I have felt from the principal and the teacher and and everyone. It's just it's just been amazing and mm -hmm. I'm scared. Mm -hmm. I'm scared to death. Well actually I wouldn't stay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, no way. Mm -hmm. Would I I'm not giving this we're not doing this again. I'm not getting not taking the risk of splitting them apart. I'm not taking a risk on all of the things that you would ask me to if the school closed. I'm one of those 10, which I think is way low. I'm, I agree. I'm Mandy's got four, so her four and my two, and there were, mm -hmm. were only two people, two houses side by side in Gaines. Mm -hmm. And the person that mows my lawn, his two, there you go. Now his four, my two, his two. Now we're at eight. Mm -hmm. And then I'm, I'm only talking us three. Sure. So I feel like you're really going to lose a lot more than you think. And they're not coming to middle school and they're not coming to high school mm -hmm. because we're not coming back to the district for that. Mm -hmm. So I just think that it's a bigger loss than mm -hmm. for you and it's a huge loss for me. Mm -hmm. I, I feel it right to my core. I, I really hate to see this happen. Sure. So um, could you add uh, just a com uh, like an asterisk next to um, when she was talking about uh, the splits, I don't know if we have that in there, but you know, moving to splits versus what we had. Okay, we're coming here, then we're going here. So GSFP was pulled out of the school this past year, right? And we were the little dragons. So I have a family that, well, and the daycare is also yep. taken out of here, so which for me was kind of, yeah, was kind of, yeah, last year. This is kind of crazy for me. Um, didn't you just say that GSRP does have a revenue stream that follows into the school? Yeah, they become self-sufficient. So the GSRP dollars fund GSRP programs. They do not fund any additional programs, but they do fund themselves. So if you were to have a GSRP program in the building, then that would be a self-sustaining program. It wouldn't be a burden to the district's general fund. Um, in terms of the GSRP allocation, so to speak to this past year, we are only given by the county a certain number of slots, and all of those slots were filled at our central Little Dragons Learning Center. Um, the state has come out with all of these dollars that the feds are putting out there, and they've said we're going to uh, open up possibly additional slots for next year. So it would be possible to possibly bring another GSRP class, and we've already got licensing out here to be able to do that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, you got that? Yes. So you're saying that Gaines is running in a negative. Do we have any other buildings in the district that also runs in a negative? 
Um, no, but I will actually have to pull actual numbers to be able to compare like apples to oranges on that or apples to apples so that I could do, uh, it's, it's easy because we have the formulas to be able to show that. Um, there aren't districts that, there aren't schools that run in the red because you have to figure that the individual school building has to generate enough revenue to pay for all of those ancillary district services. So everything it takes to operate the district, um, all of everything from legal services to our insurance and casualty and loss. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that are outside of just what the school district or school building pays for. So if you're ever running an individual building in the red, it's exacerbated greatly because what in fact is happening is the rest of your district, none of those other district costs are being supported. So that money is coming from somewhere. I could actually, I, I, I'm not prepared to give you the exact number of like, I, so I could say, well, Deke is running at a $500,000 surplus and Cyrene is at a $700,000 surplus, and, you know, whatever that number is. But I can tell you that this is the only building operating at a deficit. Um, and I should, at our next meeting, if you'd like, I can prepare those, those projections. Is that including PAC, including uh, Mary Craig Is that including all that? Uh, so the pack would be considered a part of the high school. Um, the cage? Um, so the cage up until this year, um, so that we do not have a contract as of this year now with Cage Sports. So it's truly a community center. So the community center, uh, you have to think of like, for example, um, our stadium, uh, you know, some of these other extra facilities they don't they're not school buildings that are housing students so you know you're gonna fund fifty thousand dollars to run and operate you know this community asset for whatever you know the, the, the cost is and then if you're going to try and make it revenue neutral or, or make it budget neutral you would have to run you know, rentals and things like that. And those are certainly things that we have done in the past and we do have that opportunity, but they usually do not operate in the black, those standalone facilities. Okay, and then I'm gonna come back over here. One of your slides says that um, our classrooms are 12 to 14. Yep. We have classrooms in this building at this time that run 12 to 14 students. Moving into next year, we are projecting one of the grade levels to have 12. Next year's correct. But that, is that including that's before the like kindergarten registration or anything like that? Well, we've already had kindergarten registration, and we have additional um, time that somebody could bring their kindergartner here, so that would be great. So you know of Well, t tell them to get registered, send me an email. I mean, we have people that are in, that can help them go through that process. So, you know, let's get them in touch with them. Well, there you go. Oh, it's a totally different conversation. So, okay, I'm sorry, who's, I'm, I think you've had your hand up the longest, so sorry. Uh, I have a upcoming fifth grader and a first grader. Okay. I here full time, I went here, my mom was here, you know, whole family. Did. Awesome. To see the separation of the, the kids going to different schools, that is not, that, that sucks. And I'm going to tell you personally because my son had to go to the early fives at Morris because they didn't have one here. And that, he had to ride the bus all by himself at five years old. He wasn't six yet, he was five. So he came to school with his brother, his brother walked inside, he had to get onto a bus that had three kids on it, or four kids. Orange. You would have had an enrollment child here if you would have had an early fives program here yeah, for the same. Okay, so there's two yeah. mm -hmm. just in this room. Anybody else that had to move because of that? We went to Argentina. See, so there's another reason that you might need to try to look to find the situation. There seems to be a lot of classrooms that you could turn into if you're losing your GSRP program or your preschool or whatever we're calling that. Mm -hmm. Started really five scare for kids that needed instead of shipping them off to more. He hated it. Yeah. He hated being on that bus by himself and he had to do it back and forth. 
every single day for a whole year. And he had to leave his friends that he met there to come back here because mm -hmm. this is our school. And I am one of the parents that if this school was not here, we would probably move to another district. Mm -hmm. Because I graduated from here, and this school has drastically dropped this district since we were even here, what, almost 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. I know that's not on you personally, I'm just saying. Sure. It's angering to see how things used to be run and being a, becoming a parent who is now into the school going, these people are not making any sense. There it seems like there's always a lie that's coming at you or misinformation. Okay, we'll use the misinformation that's coming at you from all over the place. They don't want to close, they want to close, they don't want to close. In my opinion, you asked me to separate myself from a parent from the district. And in my personal opinion, if I lived in this district but didn't have kids in school, I would actually ask you, why would you close a blue ribbon school mm -hmm. that makes you money, right? That makes you money when you're a blue ribbon school, correct? Um, it does. You can't tell me it doesn't. Uh, I mean, it. Academics has to bring in money somehow. I mean, it's. it's stuff from the state, and if it's not acknowledged. Yeah, I think that I think that I think that where maybe you're you're onto something there is the marketing of that achievement, okay. right? Yeah, is that what you're saying? Thing. Yeah. The next thing is this school is does such an amazing job with our community and with each other that everybody helps everybody else in this am I am I wrong in saying that? Sure. If you need something, we'll give it to you. We'll yeah. help you find it. If you if we can't personally help you with that. So if you had such a well-functioning building here, and you're asking us to buy everything. We buy every school supply for our children. We supply paper towels, we supply wipes, we supply markers, crayons, dry erase board markers. How are you in the red if we're supplying all this stuff, doing these fundraisers, uh, chipping in for our kids' schools that we couldn't even come into the building this year? You know how hard that is for a parent to walk your child into a building Especially and know year. that you can't get into it. All the teachers were new. There was not a single returning exactly. teacher this we year. Never I got to meet. My kid. Yeah, we never even got to meet. Yeah, we never even got to meet the teacher. Yes, we didn't because even have the a one long-standing teacher we had here. You guys, and we don't understand why they're all moving. But every time they're here, they're moving. We're losing and then staff. We, have half a we had a fifth-grade teacher for the first time in how long? And he's gone now. Where did he go? I heard he was in another building in this district. Yes, they all went to other sports Creek schools. Exactly. So why? why? Well, what is is that is that their choice or are you? Oftentimes, to oftentimes it is. So you're. Okay. I, I don't want to get into everybody's personal reasons, but I do know there 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 was an individual who was here, and he's an administrator in another district now. So he took a job promotion. But I mean, those. Uh, the, yes, most of the time we ask teachers, you know, what's your preference? Um, sometimes it's by choice, sometimes it's not by choice. There's a myriad of factors to that. So, okay, I mean. My last statement is for Can I speak to that for a minute, to Ryan? So, one of the things you have to understand from a teacher perspective, right? Being out here, you're a standalone, right? It's very hard to collaborate when you don't have another grade level partner, right? So, our teachers are so incredibly strong because they can stand out here by themselves on an island. Sometimes that's not for everybody, and they long for a collaboration partner. I have made a personal goal, and Mr. Micah already knows about this, for next year because uh, COVID did a lot of things, but COVID's also opened a lot of doors. So for us personally, we have great professional development plans in, in locked in for our teachers to be able to reach out to their grade level partners that are in other buildings to help them with that. So to speak to that, as, as Mr. Micah said, it is sometimes their choice because being out here, you have to be a strong independent teacher in order to do that because you are out here away from your colleagues and there is that disconnect. But we've already made the commitment to shore that up so that those teachers don't have those feelings anymore because that was a need. So some of the shortcomings that we have with that will be step turnover. We're trying to address by some of these new innovative ways to Zoom and Google in and do those things to make them not feel so isolated. So as he said, it's not 
sometimes it is by choice we can't help the way that they feel when they want to be with, with their with their collegial peers. Well, I appreciate that. I only have one more comment to make, and that is, again, with the game school, it's always games, it's always games, it's always games. Why does it always have to be the little guy? Why can't it be one of those big other schools that you have five other ones, and they move here, and you close one of those buildings, and you make them come here, instead of us always having to go there? That's just it's another option. It's a good idea. Put that up there, please. Yes. So I get that enrollment numbers drop. Like my family, I'm one of nine kids. We all went to the same school district. My husband's one of six. He all went to the same school district. We have one child. So I get the numbers <coughs> dwindle through the years because of that. Like a lot of families are much smaller nowadays. Mm -hmm. But we all went to the same school district. My mom worked at that school district. When that school district started talking about numbers are dropping, we're gonna to have to start condensing schools, we're probably gonna to have to do this, until the school made a firm commitment to say, this is our plan for five years, 10 years. Like they, I think it was you that mentioned the commitment. Mm -hmm. We had a huge exodus just because there was no consistency, there was no commitment. There was, everyone was like, oh, it's up in the air, it's all the sort of type stuff. But once they came out and said, this is the plan for, this school, this high school, this incoming freshman year is going to be the last year. Mm. They are going to graduate, and then after that, we are not taking in it. So when this freshman becomes sophomore, we are not taking any more freshman class. And so they would slowly lessen the building, the use of the building. But there was a couple years where there was no commitment, and it was just like, we know we have to close it. There's, it's always on the table, but obviously numbers are going. But we had a huge exodus. Once they said, this is what we're doing, this is the plan, they stop losing families. Mm. So okay. my personal thing is, I just moved here, my kids started in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. If there is not a firm commitment to say, this school is gonna be open for the next, through third grade, my kid will not be coming here. Mm -hmm. She, due to COVID, due to all other life things, she's been in way too many preschools as is, she needs consistency. Mm -hmm. okay. And, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's just like, just yeah, the oh, it hasn't been on the table since 2016, but mm -hmm. yeah, everyone's heard about it. I have just moved here, and I've heard about it every single year for the last three and a half years mm -hmm. through neighbors and friends. Sure. So it's just like, maybe you guys need to really seriously talk about it. At least let's make a commitment. If we are doing this, we are not going to close the school for five years. If we are doing this plan, we're going to do it for the next five years. Okay. So let's add a uh, formal commitment. Um, that's been brought up a few times. I think that's it's a great concept. Yes. I just have two quick questions. Okay. One, um, you mentioned about the um, if we were going to have to go to different schools, if it ended up being planned four or five. Sure. Um, shuttle. Okay. So if the kids have to be on the shuttle to go from one to the school to the other, um, what does that do to instruction time for them? Do they lose instruction time? Great question. Uh, no, the um, upper elementary and lower elementary buildings operate on a slightly staggered time schedule, so they're about 20 minutes difference. Okay. So that allows for kids to get in and then um, they have the same amount of instructional hours. Okay, so. so my second question is, let's say it's August, two weeks before school is supposed to start before a decision mm -hmm. on what we're doing. And let's say that decision ends up being the plan where we have the split classes here. Mm -hmm. And I decide that that's not for us. Well, I have that opportunity at that time to pick one of the other elementaries in the school district. Yeah, so we have in-district elementary choice all the time. It gets back to the comment that was made about, you know, doing that survey and finding out who right. may like to, you know, kind of pushing that idea of do you want to try to go out to gains kind of a thing. Um, so. Yes, we, we have in-district choice that happens all the time. Okay. Um, so those are options okay. that so are available. Not a deadline but that would be an option with two weeks. No, she's asking, yeah, hey, we're right. given two weeks before school starts. I don't like this program that you guys are finally deciding. Is she going to be able to say, and with two weeks? No, you know what? We it. have done things like that, yes. Um, we've had kids come to the school two weeks into school and moved them to, you know, I mean, basically, what I, my answer to you would probably be different if I hadn't been through this year and we figured out we can pretty much do anything. So, I mean, it's, it's not like my best A plan to say, hey, we'll tell you two weeks before school starts. But, and that's not our plan here. It's just this is kind of the initial 
brainstorming session, talking about a variety of things, a variety of options. We're going to take a lot of these things back, but we're going to have to have another one of these meetings, right? We're going to have to have more of these, so we don't, we don't have like a defined timeline or so saying. Say, so when are you hoping to, to know? make this decision? Well, this is, th this is the conversation. So the conversation is do nothing, which is we're getting some good feedback about that, right? Do something but run it more efficiently, which may or may not be everybody's first choice, right? Um, and then those closure things, um, you know, those are things that are probably going to have, there, there would have to be real strong impetus to try and move quickly on that, so that would probably be more of a long-term discussion. But th this is about, it's my job to be, in, to be informing the board about our, our current status. And it, it, I understand this, why gains, it's not, it's not about gains. I understand also the comments my neighbors talk about it, they talk about closing. Anybody who knows me from these meetings when I'm out here, I talk about the fact that it's a financial loser to close gains. I've said that for the last five years that argument has waned as the enrollment has dipped to where it is. I've gone and I've had conversations with community members and I've said, why are you telling people the school is closing? Where have you heard that? Well, they talked about it back then. Well, we're not talking about that now, we're not doing that. I, I can't certainly control gossip and I can't control what people talk about. Do I acknowledge that it's happening? 100%, I know that people talk about it, I'm, I'm not discarding that. But we have tried to make that commitment. I think there's some good ideas here on things that we can kind of roll forward. I think we're gonna to have to schedule another one of these, not just for the people that are here, but you know, you made a, I know, to your point, I can tell you that there are some board members that wanted to come tonight, but it didn't work. Uh, I, I do believe that you would find that there would probably, you know, in upcoming meetings, maybe be some additional members of the board that could make it. Um, and I think that would be good too, so. I have time for maybe a, a small handful of additional ones and then we'll schedule another one. So maybe some that haven't gone. So we'll go here, then here, then here, then here. Okay, I'm sorry. We'll try and get a sixth one. So I'm sorry, did you hear? So obviously the board keeps talking about closing gains because it's a financial loser. How much money is this school losing over the past five years since the discussion has been brought up year after year? Um, well, I mean, you'd have to look at like a enrollment, you know, count. So. How much did they lose last year? How much did they lose the year before? The year before that. Um, I can actually pull. So from like 2019, you know, about a figure about 150 thousand a year, compounding. So the last five years, they're losing 150 thousand a year. Roughly, yeah. In terms of like the whole district, um, we've had declining enrollment as the rest of the state has had declining enrollment. This year, the state of Michigan lost 60,000 students. Um, so we are, it sounds, this isn't like a real positive stat, but we are losing kids at a significantly lower rate than other districts. So our Declining enrollment has been curbed significantly compared to other districts that are like districts. You know, if you think of Linton, Linden, Fenton, those districts. Um, that being said, we have been declining. We did. We, for the first time in 12 years, saw the curve change two years ago, yeah, and then this year. Make money. Yes. Yeah, when you say make money, yes, you're running, you're running in the black, so, right. yep. Right, you're running in the black. Yep. So how much in the black are you running here and here? It, it's, Probably. it's variable. Probably. Well, we have a fund balance right now, which, you know, you don't want to be where we started, so five years ago we were 5% or below, which is when the state comes in and hires you a financial manager to take over the district. Okay. Uh, so we're around 13% right now. About five million dollar fund balance right now. So you guys are talking about a nonprofit organization closing a school in a community over a hundred thousand dollars as a nonprofit organization? No. That's a small percentage of five million dollars a year. 
Right. Yeah. No, we're not talking about we're not talking about this because of that. We're talking about it because um, you have an inefficiency, and so. No, it's not. It's not closing it for fun. The the the. The hard conversation, and this is, this is the difficulty. Again, the district has 36 to 3,700 students. The 120 of them out here are just as important as all of the others. But at the same time, when you think about equity across the district, you have to talk about it from a district perspective. And so if the district had an additional six, $700,000 every single year, what would that mean for children across this school district at all levels? So it's not responsible to not talk about that and to just ignore it. Now, it may not be the best decision to do anything. Maybe option one is the right decision, but we have to talk about it. And, and that's why, because you're talking about equity across all the district. You're talking about 12 grades, 13 grades, really, you know, and a lot of kids that don't have potential supports that could be offered otherwise. And maybe that's okay. Maybe the best way to invest our money is to subsidize that building, this building, and that's okay. That, that, that's what this conversation is. And so these comments and, and notes are gonna be taken back and shared and we're gonna have more of these conversations, so. It seems like if you close the school, it would affect all the kids in a negative way. Close just paying a little bit more money, bottom line goes up, just down a little bit, you guys as a whole are still making money as a nonprofit organization, which is fantastic as a nonprofit organization. Is that $100,000 that you're going to lose next year really that big of a deal in the whole? No, that, that particular uh, number is not, but that number is going to be higher than that next year. Well, because that was giving you, that's giving you, that's giving you a projection from 2019. So you're seeing about a 19 student loss, which represents. Projection 2021 and the projection, you already know your projection is going to be higher. That's not a very good projection. No, we have a pretty good handle on what we think those numbers are going to be. But you just told me it's going to be higher. What did I tell you? When I told you the number that we're, right. Yes, yes. You're talking about the, uh, you're looking at revenue. But what you have to look at is expenditure. So when we staff, so this is what I said at the beginning, when you staff your building, right, you staff based on a student to staff ratio. And when you staff on a, based on a student to staff ratio, you're not fully staffing for all of the kids here. So if you fully staff for all of the kids here, you're gonna add about two and a half additional staff members. And we do have postings that are gonna be out there. About 287,000. Teacher costs about $100,000 with their benefit package and everything. Really? Yes. They're not making 100000 but by the time you pay 45% for retirement, by the time you pay a $25,000 insurance package, by the time you put all that together, it's a rough number. It's between $85,000 and $120,000 for a teacher. So, all right. Yep, so we're going to come... Sorry, I know I had pointed to five. They don't feel they're making hundred thousand. I don't feel, I don't feel like they're making hundred thousand. I think they should actually make hundred thousand. But, but, yeah, I agree with you. I just, I, what I'm telling you is the direct. Two point five divided by, you know, two hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars. You're talking roughly hundred fifteen thousand dollars a year. You're spending on two hundred eighty. Correct. That's that's part of what I'm trying to explain is. The salary is actually one of the smallest portions of the cost. Still as a whole, you're talking about closing a whole community that's based around this school over your whole budget is less hundred thousand, hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollars. It doesn't make sense. Okay. You know what I'm saying? You've had your hand up, I'm sorry. I was wondering with your figures on the first where it was like lead as is. Yep. Um, because we've been running split classes for a while now. So I just wanted to make sure that this was representative of us already splitting and not being fully staffed because my kid came here when it was third, fourth, and fifth all in one classroom. Mm -hmm. yep. And I know it was still two teachers, but it wasn't three. So is this set at like full tilt or is this actually what we operated at with the split class already in it? 
this is full tilt. So this was when we had the split because the next one shows more splits. So is it just more significant because <clears throat> you're splitting several? So these are scenarios. They're not real. They're not like based on. So this was if we had. If you had a fully staffed building, Which right? Correct. And, 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 but in, if you're thinking, this is about an idea. So if you're thinking about next year. Can I see like the final figure, like the operating surplus here versus the one where you had the split? Like yeah. This would be, so this oops. So like $100,000 different, and so this is really more realistic to how we operate now. Right? Mm -hmm. And for the last five years. Right, and mm -hmm. for yep. years. So I feel like the first one is a, is a very skewed view of do nothing because that's not how we ever operated. Well, that isn't true. We did well, have a fully staffed building, yeah, right? Really but as of 2019, we were running more splits. And so this model right here is more, right. So as you think about like all five possible ideas and there are 25, probably 100 additional ideas somewhere in between there, it might be, well, we're not gonna run all splits, but we're gonna run a split at KT, right, some. I will say, uh, we have had people leave the district from Gaines that have had a split classroom, and they've told us, I'm leaving because you split the class. Well, and we had third, fourth, and fifth together. We had 60 kids in one classroom, which is like crazy. So I you had two teachers in there, but yes. Yeah, but it was like they ended yeah. up within the first week, they split those five. Yeah. Yes, right? they did. Yep. So I see why the parents oh panicked, but it was like, again, about like, oh my gosh, why are we jamming all of these kids in one space? Mm -hmm. We need more of a commitment, but my main concern was just that I didn't feel like that first slide was representative of how the school as is. Right, right, right. So a better, for the next meeting, a better way to say that is to say fully staffed or, you know, like a teacher per grade or, or whatever it is. It's just more accurate to say here's how we are now. This is as is. Mm -hmm. Like if we interjected more staff than we have now, okay. yeah. we wouldn't do that if we're not doing that. All right, so we're not doing so I don't even feel like those the, extra numbers are worth calculating because it's just not practical. Yeah, the, the challenge is the way that the numbers fall, it makes it really difficult because you don't want to run a split class with like 32 or, you know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's. I just don't like looking at the overinflated version of it. It's like worst case scenario to leave it as is when that's really not how it's, how it's running. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I just noticed that right away. Mm -hmm. it's, as is, as is. This, like this is probably, that's probably as close to as is right there. Right, so yeah. that's just a pretty significant difference when you're saying we're gonna off, like be 150 grand off. Well, we just took 100 away from that. So the deficit is, so in theory, let me, much less than that. Let me, let me just clear something up because this, this is an important number to look at, okay? But the difference is not just $100,000 off. So if you're looking at option four or five, and I'm not saying that that's the right option, it's more like $600,000, $500,000, okay? And that's, that's a much bigger swing. And that's a, that's a building, that's a compounding thing every year. Now you're talking over two years, a million, over two and a half, you know. So it, you can look at numbers a variety of ways. I'm putting out scenarios that are potentials. These may not even be the things that people decide they would like to even look at. Um, I just wanted to start the conversation somewhere. What's the so, margin at Elms Road? You're asking the same question that was asked. I don't have, I don't have that, but thousands? yes. Okay. okay, we're gonna go here and then we'll take one more. Or, or you had your hand up still? I just have a comment. I just have a comment. Okay. How many other Blue Ribbon schools are in the district? Zero. Why don't we use this as a model for the other schools to follow and bring some of the kids out here? I, I, the question was, why don't we use this school as an, a model and bring more kids out? And how many other schools are blue ribbon schools? And it's, if you say zero. zero. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Last three. One, two, three. I think the, the point that we have to look at is that, okay, yeah, there's a problem, so we need to look at the solution. And I don't think the solution is closing this school. You obviously hear a lot of people don't want to do that. Sure. So, so the real key that is how do you fix the problems? And one of the problems is transportation. That's been something mm -hmm. that, so it's gonna be a multi-faceted way to fix your problem. You're gonna need to look at transportation. You're gonna need to look at 
um, having GSRP and Head Start and Early Head Start to be feeders to your to your classrooms, not just here, but in other parts of your district as mm -hmm, well. Mm -hmm. You're going to need to look at child care options for families because people aren't going to choose to come here um, when they have to go somewhere else to go to last services. They're mm -hmm. just not. And then you can also really look at, you know, a lot of families don't qualify for Early Head Start. They're over income, especially um, out here. So maybe you want to think about doing some child care options out here as well, because those are also feeders for your mm -hmm. school. So you need to look at feeders for your school to get it to grow. Can you add tuition, tuition-based child care? Yes, sir. Uh, two quick questions. Yep. The first one is, when you end up closing, can you get this first? Can your other schools support it, and what is, are they going to be correct? Is there going to be increases in the cost of sending them there, and what's that compared to keeping them here? What's, like, how does that work together? Like, is it justifiable? And my second one is, everybody's going to to keep this school open, right? You can't work towards a goal until you know how to achieve that goal. What do you and the board and all of the district need to see to keep this school open? What do we need to do? What do you need to do? Like, is it going yeah. to be making a profit, or can we be close to it? And yeah. So I think for so I'll, let me answer that a couple different ways. First part of the question, without question, there's plenty of capacity in the other elementary schools to house the students. That's that. That's that's just the first part. The count. Okay, so at um, at Morish and Elms, you have about 450 students in those buildings. At uh, Cyrene and at uh, Deke, you have about 300. So the the west side is smaller than the east side. Um, in terms of cost of transportation, as I kind of said, it's it's about neutral because they're going to be brought in. They're coming. The buses are coming out empty, and they're pulling them back into that area. We already do that for the secondary runs already. So um, it's it's pretty cost neutral in terms of transporting them out there. So. The, the real question is trying to peg and project, and you aptly said, we have no idea. I mean, there are going to be people that leave if the building closes. Right. We know that. We don't know how many, um, but that's, that's what you're throwing a dart at a dartboard, and maybe 35 is not enough. Maybe it's 50, maybe it's 60. I, we don't know. No, I totally understand that you can't for sure put your finger on that. I get that. That's yep. not my question. My question is, how many students are there going to be in the class? If you project, let's say we close the school, how many of these things are you going to lose? I mean, we don't know, but we in the projection, 35. Oh, 35. Yeah. Okay. So if we lose that and send all the kids out of there, out of here, is it worth it? Price wise, are we like, are you gaining enough profit or not profit, but money back to justify doing that to a community? So that's. My wife, like I said, my wife wants to know what's your headcount for class or not? Like my oldest is high on the spectrum, very high functioning, but he's still on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Big classrooms aren't going to work for him. Mm -hmm. Small classrooms do. He does great. Like he's sure. That's another thing that we have to look at. Other big classrooms, you know. Yeah. So can you, is it just? Yeah. So the classroom sizes are going to be bigger in other buildings. That's part of the inefficiency. So while it is wonderful. I mean, what'd you say? 26, 26, 27 at the early elementary. After, after, yeah. So you're going to have a balancing. So you have, you have in the upper elementary schools a little bit higher. So higher numbers in classes, yes. That's ridiculous to ask third graders to have 30, 35 kids. Not 35. We don't have any 35s. So. A couple years ago. You just said 26 to 27. Oh, in, they're not that high. In the lower elementary, yep. So recommended, recommended, the our our goal, our target class size for uh, kindergarten and first is 26. Most of our classrooms this year are running around 28. Okay. And what, so. What are the numbers to show that that's a good number? Because I know years ago that there were reports and research and all sorts of stuff saying that you can't have. 25, 30 kids in a lower elementary school class and have them be successful. So you want to put a smaller school and put more kids in there, which is actually going to hurt more kids. 
by having more kids in the class? No. Um, so in, in the event that there were kids, so there's going to be um, teachers that are not hired, right, to fill some of our current gaps if the teachers here are going to fill those gaps. So you're drawing down, you're balancing classes. Classes are getting balanced. But that's what he's asking. Like what, would, what would the numbers be if this school closed and kids went to other schools? You're saying 26, 27, 28. It's going to be what they are now, is what I'm saying. But are, do the numbers, does the research support that much for... Like, the, so there's... Well? there. said that that was ridiculous to ask of elementary school kids to have that many in class. That's what I'm asking. Okay, so you're going to ask a ton of different people what the research says about that. There is no empirical research that's out there, and I disagree with this, so I'm going to make a statement, and then I'm going to qualify it, okay? And I'm, I, like, I'm not the, for or against, I'm just... I, right, I'm, I'm going to give you what the... So there is literally no empirically vetted meta-analysis that would suggest that class size has a significant impact on learning. Now, I'm going to tell you, as a former teacher, I find that to be ridiculous, okay? So... From a practical standpoint, as somebody who's been in a classroom, 28 is harder to manage than 12 or 14, okay? So lower class size gives, if you just want to do a math equation, more time, a more of my energy for each child, right? So it makes sense that a lower class size is going to be better. I don't have research that's going to support that claim, though. In fact, the research would say that class size has little effect on learning. I don't know how that jives. I know practically I don't feel that to be true. So with that being said, you asked about the research. That's what's, that's what's out there on that. So um, we have a lower class size comparatively to our peers across the county. We made that investment about four years ago with our teachers. For, for gains, I will tell you, part of this conversation, it would be a shell shock. Right? If you're going from a classroom of 14 kids to a classroom of 28, that's a big change. And that, that would be the case, but that's also part of the question, if you were a parent at Morris Elementary School and you're saying, why do they get 14 kids in a classroom and I have to have 27 or whatever it is, that's that whole conversation about equity. So, yeah. But if you bust them all to gains, your classroom's at 28. So it's the same thing. So. Yeah. Right, right, right. What I'm trying to say is if you could balance that and you brought all of those, you drew those down to 25 and then you brought 25 out here, now you're balanced. Now, but you're not going to have 14. Right. 14 so. Who wants 14? Nobody. I mean, I don't, yeah. Nobody wants 14, but we've run classes of 14. I'm taking cupcakes to school for 14 kids. No. You. 25, well, actually, my oldest is yeah. 39. Not in 39 years have yeah. I taken cupcakes to school for 14 years. No. So that's not my reality. That that has been my reality here. Yeah. It okay. wasn't my reality this past year. All right. I, I want to try and get these two, and then I do have to say we will schedule another one of these. A lot, you know, this is kind of going over, but I will, and I'll stick around for a few minutes if you have individual questions. To your point, you said, what would it need to look like, right? That's the second question. Like, to, to, yeah, so first of all, I'm going to preface this by saying I do not make any decision whatsoever, but I have a critical role in informing the board, okay? So I don't have a vote, but I have a critical role in boots on the ground, if you will, okay? So what I would tell you is, if I were to see, because I wouldn't probably even bring the conversation up, okay, if we were to start to see a curbing of that enrollment. So it's not necessarily you went from 120 to 180 in one year. It's, hey, you were at 120, okay, and you just went to 135 or 140. You're starting to see that turn in a, in a good direction. Then... I think the conversation needs to be, okay, look it, this is a start, right? And so how do we continue to build on that? And I think a lot of the ideas that people have shared are good. There's not a single person that I'm aware of, I'm sure they're out there, that wants to close this building. That's, that's not why I'm here. I'm genuinely here to generate ideas and to bring awareness around a very significant issue. So these are all things that we're going to take back to our team, we're going to talk about. 
I don't, I don't speak for the board, but the board, and Jessica, I think, wants to make a couple closing comments. They're going to see this, and they're also going to just be weighing in on the conversation. There's no scheduled decision that has to be made. Right now, it's about how, how do we generate ideas? How do we fix this, right? And I don't think anyone expects you're going to go from here to here in one year. But do we see people starting to send their kids back to Gaines? Maybe fewer kids sent, being sent to Byron and they're coming here. Maybe some of those things that many of you have talked about. If we could see those trends change, I think that to me is a really positive sign. Because we've run the building at 140 already, right? So it's not like we can't run it. I mean, we technically could run it at 120. You know, the question is about efficiency. And so, but as you start to see improvement in those areas, then I think you can start to say, okay, well, what, what's the next step? How do we hit our next target? So I, I, there's not a single board member, I can tell you this, and I can definitely say this for them, that wants to close gains. That's not, yeah, it's, but, but it is a conversation about, okay, what are we gonna do? So we're here, we're having that. Um, I'll give you your question, and then I'll let you kind of close and then with your comments, and then I will stick around for a few minutes if you have other questions. Yes, sir. Is there a such thing as like an operational millage or something that Gaines could get past to keep the, the school open to, to offset the deficit, is it, or is it like a separate but equal versus other elementary schools, or is there? That's a super, that's a super that interesting was, that was, question. That bomb, right? it so. But it's still money that Gaines residents thought thought we were going to get the benefit of towards our school for the next 20 years. I'm talking about and operations. Now, I'm talking about salaries and well, taking this, keeping the school open. I find it a little suspect that we get the bond passed at $80 million with promises of grand old gains and this is what's going to happen only now to have stuck in our face, oh, no, gains might close. I'm just, so again, I'm just brainstorming an idea. If you want to have your school open, you got to have ideas. Can I get a refund on my bond? Yes. Uh, yeah, so he asked if there was a function to, say, like an operating millage of sorts. And to answer your question, I really don't know. It's, it's an interesting idea. So um, Katie is MIA. So... Um, Thanks. Just operating millage. Oh, you got the right. Okay. All right. All right. I will stick around for a few minutes. Uh, Jessica, I don't know if you want to say anything before I close. Well, I'm going to defer for just a quick second. I'll give up 30 seconds. Yeah. coming out and talking to us and, and giving us information, giving us what you have. I will say it probably be better if you brought more board members. Thank yeah, you. yeah. Thank you, Dr. Weber. Yes, but thank you for coming out and listening to us and talking to us. And, and this won't be the last time, and I appreciate the comment. Um, like I said before, I, I understand. I don't understand because I'm not you and I haven't been in this situation. <laughs> But I understand fighting for what you love, what you're passionate about, and what, you know, I, I have four children of my own, and I understand that. So I want you to understand, as hard as this conversation is to have, there's nobody that wants this to happen, regardless of what people will rumorize or whatever, but we're here and we need to continue this conversation. So um, we will set up another one of these. Um, we're going to update some of the slides. We're going to add some of these things into the conversation. It'll be like a conversation too. Um, and I will talk to the board to see if additional board members can be present. I think that would be very helpful. Um, so, okay. So, um, thank you. I'm Jessica Lee. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of background. So I'm going to you. Oh, thank you. I was appointed to the board. 
secretary. And there are a couple things that I would, I would like to say when thinking about this that um, I will say this to clarify that as a board and individually, or at least I can, I'll speak for myself and as other people, I have not had conversations with other board members about closing gates. Quite honestly, I don't have very many conversations at all with members of the community who bring this up. And I, during, while I was running, I talked to a resident that lived out here that said, Yes, I have my support, blah, blah, blah. And then she called back and said, I have a question for you. Where do you stand on closing meetings? And can you promise that you're going to close meetings? And I said, truth be told, I can't make that promise. But nobody, we all as human beings, want a sense of security and safety. I get it, my kids want to march. I want them to be safe and secure. I can't even guarantee that in the next three years, I can go to the closing march. Like, I The circumstances and the situation as a board member it is my responsibility, I think, to make responsible decisions again. That number one, my priority list is our students first, our staff second, and our community and everything else third. Like that's that's the order of what is my priority in making decisions when I vote and, and take information and how is this gonna affect them. Whether that's right or wrong, I don't know. I'm just telling you right now that. Right? And I'm sitting here and thinking and trying to equate it with an, an analogy of if I took on a financial responsibility, if each of you took on a financial responsibility at home, and for some reason it broke down, it was whatever, and it was no longer functioning well, would you continue to, to, to pay for it and make a commitment to pay for it, or would you at some point sell it or be done with it? Right? And I'm not saying that that's the case. It's just, I think, the practical way of looking at this. And I'm not saying by any means, again, that I'm saying that I think that games should close. That's not it because there are some things as far as the community. The important thing for me to say, or that I think when I heard people tonight talk about, well, they talked, and then another woman said, and I'm sorry to um, kind of maybe put you a little on the spot, but, and she said, I've lived here for a year, and my neighbors and other community members have said it. And you know what? That's not, and when we talk about the district, to me, that's talking about the board members and the administration. And I'd like to ask you, have you heard us talking about it? Or have you heard the community talking about it? And that, to me, to an extent, that is, when I start, when I start talking about things in those terms, that's my, my fear sometimes. Talking, right, my, in my assumptions. Like, and I would say this, let me ask you, and I get 